Good morning or afternoon or evening, whatever time of day it is for you, welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this community and resource where our whole goal is to help you develop the habit of getting into Scripture. It is a habit that will change your life because that's what God's Word does, yeah? My name is Rebecca. I'm a pastor, and I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit. I say welcome. Uh, it's an honor to get to walk through your, or walk alongside you in your journey with God and hopefully to fall in love with this word. Yeah. I'm going to wait just a second. We are in a study of Proverbs. We have been reading a proverb a day. So today is the 24th day of the month. So we're going to read Proverbs 24. I'm going to wait just a second for friends to join and let me know that the signal and everything is good. Like Gloria, good morning, Gloria. And Susan, good morning, guys. I hope you're well. <clears throat> I'm going to take a quick sip of my drink here. It is kind of an overcast day. I actually had to reset up just a little bit because there wasn't, even still, there's kind of not enough light. I'm sorry, the video isn't as great. Oh, good. Thank you, Susan. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray and we're going to jump in. We're going to read through Proverbs 24. And then uh, I've picked out a few verses that hit me, but I want to know the verses that hit you. All right, so let's pray. Good morning, Lord. God, we want to silence all the other noise. We want to hear you. We want to sense your spirit with us, God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, this comforter, this counselor. We lean into you today, God. Thank you for your word. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I am just so thankful that God gives us the chance to have wisdom beyond ourselves, you know? Um, there's a lot of lessons that we learn on our own, honestly, from our mistakes. But I appreciate the wisdom that we can glean from someone else, and specifically from the Lord through His Word, that can protect us from making some bad mistakes, you know what I mean? It's going to be 80 where you are, Susan. Remind me, where are you? That's crazy. Okay, let's go ahead and read Proverbs 24. Don't envy the evil or desire to be with them, for their hearts plan violence, and their words stir up trouble. A house is built by wisdom, and it is established by understanding. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with every precious and beautiful treasure. A wise warrior is better than a strong one, a man of knowledge than one of strength. For you should wage war with sound guidance. Victory comes with many counselors. Wisdom is inaccessible to a fool. He does not open his mouth at the city gate. The one who plots evil will be called a schemer. A foolish scheme is sin and a mocker is detestable to people. If you do nothing in a difficult time, your strength is limited. Rescue those being taken off to death and save those stumbling towards slaughter. If you say, but we didn't know about this, won't he who weighs hearts consider it? Won't he who protects your life know? Won't he repay a person according to his work? Eat honey, my son, for it is good, and the honeycomb is sweet to your palate. Realize that wisdom is the same for you. If you find it, you will have a future, and your hope will never fade. Don't set an ambush, you wicked one, at the camp of a righteous man. Don't destroy his dwelling. Though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get up, but the wicked will stumble into ruin. Don't gloat when your enemy falls, and don't let your heart rejoice when he stumbles, or the Lord will see, be displeased, and turn his wrath away from him. Don't be agitated by evildoers, and don't envy the wicked. For the evil have no future, the lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord as well as the king, and don't associate with rebels. For destruction will come suddenly to them or suddenly from them. Who knows what distress these two can bring? These sayings also belong to the wise. 
It is not good to show partiality and judgment. Whoever says to the guilty, you are innocent, peoples will curse him and nations will denounce him. But it will go well with those who convict the guilty and a generous blessing will come to them. He who gives an honest answer gives a kiss on the lips. Complete your outdoor work and prepare your field. Afterward, build your house. Don't testify against your neighbor without cause. Don't deceive with your lips. Don't say, I'll do to him what he did to me. I'll repay the man for what he has done. I went by the field of a slacker and by the vineyard of the one lacking sense. Thistles had come up everywhere, weeds covered the ground, and the stone wall was ruined. I saw, and I took it to heart. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest, and your poverty will come like a robber and your need like a bandit. Proverbs 24. Yeah. Um, this proverb, there's a lot of emphasis on the person receiving the wisdom and their relationship with those considered, you know, wicked. Uh, there's a lot of things in there. Some it talks about the perspective, like, you know, don't envy them, don't be jealous of them, you know. Uh, we're going to dig into it. But I just want to say again, can you point out the verses that stick to you? Can you do that for me? Put it in the comments. All right, here we go. The first section I just I want to point out. Their hearts plan violence. Their words stir up trouble. Opening of this proverb talks about the evil one, right? And it talks about their words or the result of their actions being something that breaks down. If you see that, is it freezing for anyone else? Let me know. Their hearts play in violence, their words stir up trouble. Don't, don't desire even to be with them. This here, what, what we're gonna see in Proverbs 24 is there's actually a lot of structure that's put in. Um, there are groupings of verses that go together and there's clear separations in some of them. This one is going to contrast with the one directly next to it. Here's why. It talks about evil people and it talks about ruin and destruction like a breaking down. But what does it say about wisdom? Verse 3 says, A house is built by wisdom. It is established by understanding. By knowledge, rooms are filled. Right? So this is giving a really pretty contrast. A beautiful contrast. Evil things are going to break down. Wisdom is going to build up. Let me know, guys, if this signal is good for everybody else. Faith Life Study Bible. This proverb advises against envying wicked people, perhaps for the success and the prosper prosperity they enjoy. This proverb describes the constructive nature of wisdom. Is it worth me trying to go out and come out again? I'm going to continue. It'll, re it'll record and it'll load the whole video up. I'm sorry you guys are having a signal problem. Okay. This next proverb talks about a wise warrior being, strong, being better than a strong one. And you know that phrase, uh, work stronger, not harder? I mean, work harder, smarter, not stronger. How did that go? Hmm? This gives the same idea. And, and this, remember, this is a king imparting wisdom, but uh, he's imparting it to his son, right? He's saying here, a wise warrior is better than a strong one. Why? If you look at verse six, you should wage war with sound guidance. Victory comes with many counselors. I wrote, uh, just my observation, those who approach war as a sole means of strength or force, they miss out on the victory that comes through wisdom. I'm sure you and I could think. In fact, there's even really practical evidence of such today. There's questions about um, certain 
countries doing shows of force, shows of force, and they're not communicating and they're not getting guidance. It's, it's very singular and it's causing harm, right? I appreciate this showing that the king is imparting to his son. Listen, when you rule, your victory is going to come when you have a wealth of really great wise advisors, counselors, where you're coming up with a decision together. It's not meant to be all on your shoulders and don't just go off to war. For those that have gone through the study with us where we looked at Solomon's life and the life of his son, I just want to point out this piece of wisdom I think would have really benefited his son had uh, had he taken advantage of it. Why? Because Solomon died, his son took the throne, and the son, who was young and inexperienced, basically kicked out all his dad's advisors, and he only took wisdom from his buddies that he grew up with, right? And so it, it literally, within one generation, the kingdom is completely split. God's kingdom is destroyed, split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, because he did not follow this wisdom. Yeah. I also want to say this wisdom applies in leadership as well. Have you ever met leaders that want to lead with a show of force? I just got to show them I'm strong. I can get it done. Right? They come down with a thick hammer. The team is not very unified. It's more authoritarian of a leadership style. And it doesn't, it doesn't end well, you know? Usually on those teams, they might reach their goal, but they have had, they've had people wounded along the way, you know? Here, this says a wise leader is going to pursue victory through letting a lot of people weigh in, the wise advisors and counselors, letting them weigh in too. And it's the same encouragement for you and I as we lead. Don't feel like you have to lead by your strength, that you have to be the one, oh, sorry, carrying everything. That's not actually really great leadership. Great leadership is when you surround yourself with really wise people and you guys work together, right? I'm sure you've heard that before. All right. Up here, verse 10 through 12. I didn't bold it. I should have bolded it. It says, if you do nothing in a difficult time, your strength is limited. I like actually this other translation. It says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you do nothing in a difficult time, or if you faint in the day of adversity, saying your strength is limited or small. Um, this is showing there are situations where tough things happen, right? Because that's life. Adversity is going to come. The question is, what are you going to do in the middle of it? What are you going to do? And this proverb points specifically to looking beyond yourself and protecting your own needs. This says on this day of adversity where you're seeing other people being carted off to death, are you going to stand there and do nothing? If you do, know that God sees that. Yeah, look at it again. If you do nothing in a difficult time, your strength is limited. Rescue those being taken off to death. Save those stumbling towards slaughter. If you say, oh, but we didn't know about this. Won't he who weighs hearts consider it? Won't he who protects your life know? Won't he repay a person according to his work? I love that verse 12 says, oh, but we didn't know. How often do people play ignorant, right? It's not that they're that they genuinely didn't have knowledge is that they wanted to be ignorant so that they wouldn't be held accountable, right? So people say, oh, I don't know. The Lord knows. You can't play ignorant with God. When I see this, maybe it's because of this dinner we had last night. Um, we had a, a friend who had traveled to Africa on mission. He came and he shared his story. And when I read this, I am reminded that it is so easy for you and I as believers, specifically in the U.S., we, we live in a bubble, don't we? We live in a bubble. Um, even watching the news, you know, like there's so many things that happen in the world that never even make it onto our radar. And you know why they don't? Because the media knows that you don't care. 
it's really hard sometimes to get um, news coverage, information shared about horrible things happening in the world because they say a lot of the first world people just, they don't wanna hear that. It's gonna make them uncomfortable. I'm reminded that there are people on the other side of the world that, that are being carted off to death. There's a great adversity coming into their towns, into their homes. I'm thinking of, um, there was a, a time in the city and a, a friend's church actually ministered in this village. There was a civil war and then um, after the civil war, like these rebel people came. In the civil war, a lot of the dads had died and the dads were the ones that were working in the fields, right? They had all died. And then these rebels came and they stole all the sons the sons who were the ones that were able to then step into their father's place and work the field, they're all stolen and put into slavery. And this is in the Sudan, right? Most of us didn't hear about it. Uh, this friend's church, they did. They, they said, we can't stay blind to it. And they actually, uh, they adopted this village to the point where they raised funds they bought all their sons out of slavery and returned their sons to the mothers. And then the next year, they raised money and they taught life skills. They helped set up irrigation system. They taught the sons how to work the fields. And then another year, they did fresh water, clean water. Another year, you know, like they, they decided, I'm not going to pretend that I don't know. I'm not going to pretend that I'm blind because God knows. If I see someone in the middle of adversity, being carted off to death, and I do nothing. You know? Proverbs speaks to me. I hope it speaks to you. David Gusick said, Adversity does not make you small. It reveals your strength to be small. That's the truth. The proverb warns against ignoring such people and later claiming ignorance. God weighs the heart and knows the truth. That was from the Faith Study Bible, Faith Life Study Bible. I highlighted in blue verse 13 and the beginning of 14 because it's about honeycomb. And if you know me, you know I like bees. Um, it just said, you know, honeycomb is sweet to the palate. Eat it, enjoy it. It's good for you. And then the writer says, wisdom is the same. Yeah. Realize that wisdom is the same for you. Yeah. Mm. All right. Verse 15 and 16, this is a word of wisdom that goes together. Don't set an ambush, you wicked one, against the camp of a righteous man. Don't destroy his dwelling. Though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get up, but the wicked will stumble into ruin. David Gusick pointed out, many commentators insist that the fall about a righteous person falling, the fall of a righteous man that it might be experienced here is trouble, not sin. But there's actually no adequate reason why it cannot include both ideas. A righteous person falling seven times. It might be that they get tripped up. It might be that trouble comes to them and seems to cast them down. The key, uh, beautiful, prom not promise, um, principle <laughs> is that a righteous person who's wanting to live for the Lord, they, they have something uh, that another pastor friend of mine calls spiritual buoyancy, spiritual buoyancy. Have you ever tried to throw like a, an air thing into the water and it might go down for a second, but then it always has a way of coming back up. Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pastor Swanepoel, I, I'll never forget that. He said spiritual buoyancy. He was talking about Joseph, how Joseph had had all these awful things happen. Favor isn't not having adversity. Favor of God is this spiritual buoyancy that brings you right back up. And this proverb is saying a righteous person, they have this extra thing. <laughs> they have this extra thing. They can fall seven times, but they're not going to be destroyed. An evil person will. An evil person, something bad will happen to them, some trouble or calamity or something, and it'll ruin them. But not a righteous person. Yes, they have the favor of the Lord. They have this buoyancy that allows them to rise above it. It says, but it's the wicked will stumble to ruin. All right, verse 19 and 20. Don't be agitated by evildoers. Don't envy the wicked. 
for the evil have no future and the lamp of the wicked will be put out. I like that word agitated. I, li I like that this translation uses the word agitated. I'm just gonna ask it. Have you ever had a moment or moments in your life where maybe you've been walking through something and it's not, I don't know, it's not been going as good as you want it to go, but you look over and you see someone else, someone that you know is has no interest in the Lord, right? They're not interested in the Lord. They're like flaunting their whatever. And yet it seems like they're living a great life. They're moving ahead. They're doing whatever, right? I know I'm not the only one that it has felt that way. I remember there was a season um, specifically where Tucker and I were walking through just a tough space and it seemed like this other person was not impacted. In fact, you know, had a lot of our money and we're off living it up. And it, just, it was just like, oh, like what's going on, God? This proverb says, hey, look, don't, don't be agitated. Don't let them get under your skin. Don't envy the wicked. The word is the evil have no future. And even when it says their lamp will be snuffed out, that's talking about their legacy long term. There, there, is, there is a measure of justice that God commits to bring. But his lens, the way that he looks at things is so much longer and deeper than what you and I see. We might look on the surface and we might see someone who doesn't love the Lord that's seemingly living it up and don't fall to the trap of getting upset and agitated about that. Don't fall into the trap of comparison or asking God why, or, you know, the agitation, the uh, is getting at you. Don't, don't let that happen. Don't let it happen in your heart. Trust that the Lord is sovereign and he will be complete in his justice. As he, as he administers justice, it will be complete. Yeah. Tell me I'm not the only one that has felt that way, y'all. Verse 26. He who gives an honest answer gives a kiss on the lips. A kiss on the lips. I wonder what on earth is that saying? Because it seems a little weird. <laughs> Remember, different culture. Culture and context are vital for us to be able to understand. And in this culture, you greet with a kiss. You greet a friend or someone you respect with a kiss on the cheek. Right? And this isn't the only culture that does that. There are actually quite a few cultures where that side kiss is the welcome, hello, greeting of a friend and someone that's respected. And so this proverb says an honest word. When, when someone tells the truth, it's like a kiss on the lips, meaning it's, it's a sign of friendship and respect for the person. Right? He who gives an honest answer gives a kiss on the lips. John Barry wrote, an honest person shows respect to others by telling the truth. Man. Verse 27, complete your outdoor work and prepare your field. Afterward, build your house. Complete your outdoor work, prepare your field. Afterward, build your house. This proverb is a standalone. It's just that one verse. There's a lot of wisdom in it, isn't there? This proverb is giving us an understanding of order. It's giving us an understanding of priority. Why? Why does this stick out? Why is this a word of wisdom, right? Why do you think that they suggested that the outdoor work and the field preparation be done ahead of building the house? Why do you think that is? I want you to put it in the comments. Can you do that? Why? Why would, why should a wise person prepare their field and like get all the outdoor work done and prepare their field before they even start building a house? And then the second follow-up question is, how good are we at following that advice? That word of wisdom. I'm gonna wait because I wanna see your comments. Yeah. 
Dave Ramsey. I know I quote Dave Ramsey a lot in Proverbs, but that's because there's so much wisdom here, specifically as it comes to finances. Um, this example, it shows that uh, wise people, they have a longer field of vision. They're able to think further ahead and they understand that long term, in order to reap a really great benefit, they have to take care of some stuff way ahead, knowing that they won't actually get the benefits of it then, but they got to do the work now if they want to reap the result later. Yeah, Susan wrote, so they can eat, can't work without eating, and also for finances. Yeah. So in this case, using an example of the, the family that has a field, that has a farm, right? It's so vital that the farmer get his plant in the ground. Like that is essential. He has to do the work. There's a, there's a window of time that has to be done that has to take priority because if you don't prioritize that, you can miss the field for planting, which means you'll miss the harvest, right? You got to do that first. I would just like to propose, you tell me if I'm wrong, I think in our society, in our culture currently, everybody wants to build the house, but no one wants to prepare the field. You know what I'm saying? Everybody wants to build the house. They want to build a place for entertaining. They want to build the place that represents their status or whatever. They want to build that. They want to build the place that they get to enjoy. But the proverb for the wise says the wise does the work first. The house is, is after. Set the right things in order first. Yeah? All right. Very last word. So this is the last word of the wise. I want you to see it's five verses. All right? I love that I see your I see your response. Yeah. Build a house while crops are growing, right? In this last section, the writer talks about going to the field of a slacker. And as this connects, I think, with the verse just before. These verses talk about they went to the field of a slacker, and what do they see? They see weeds everywhere. They see um, a field kind of in ruin. They see the wall is torn down right? It's a mess. Do you think that field is producing anything? No, it's not. There's no one tending it. It's not going to produce a harvest. And the writer connects this, this neglected field, which is supposed to be someone's sustenance and their livelihood and how it's neglected by a slacker, by someone who is um, lazy, Someone who gets tired quick and wants to take a rest, you know. In fact, look, it says here, uh, verse 33, it kind of points out a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest. And it says, and your poverty is going to come like a robber, your need like a bandit. Being lazy will cost you a lot in the long run. At first, it might just seem like an overgrown field. It might just seem like a broken wall. But what comes next is poverty and need. In this chapter, I think one of the things that I take note of in my heart is this continued word about wisdom and how a wise person is looking much further ahead. There's my mailman. You get to see him today. Um, the wise person is looking much further ahead. And I think that's so good because on an average day to day, I would say that I think most of our people don't operate very far ahead at all. In fact, they actually call poverty mentality when you're just looking at what's in front of you. You're making decisions only off of what's here. You're not considering long-term impact. And as a result, it ends up perpetuating this poverty mentality. Yeah. Wise person, I'm telling myself, a wise person does the work now for what comes ahead. The wise person is willing to do the work, is not going to get lazy, is not going to take their time because they understand time is of the essence. They need to do it now. 
And as I wrap up, I think again of Dave Ramsey with finances. Um, when you look at retirement funds, this, this is something we, we talked about in our, in our small group where we're teaching about finances. Retirement funds are one of those things that the earlier you start, the better, right? The earlier you start, the better, because even if you're putting in less, it ends up yielding more if you take advantage of time, right? And those who prioritize other things ahead of it, they lose valuable time. And so then when they do start putting in retirement, they can yield some, but it's not going to be anything like what it could have been if they had done the work in the beginning. Yeah, so much wisdom in this proverb. I pray that you and I will hear that call to wisdom, that you and I will hear the danger, um, not getting sidetracked, evaluating evil uh, people that don't love the Lord and how they seem to have success. Don't let your sights go there. Instead, say, Lord, help me to be wise. Help me, help me to consider sowing now something that I might not get to enjoy or reap for many years to come. Help me, Lord, to understand the value of not taking it easy and taking a lot of breaks on something right now that could end up having a great benefit in the future if I don't take it easy. I don't know. Help, help, us, help us know, Lord. Help us walk this out in wisdom, we ask. In your name, amen. Lots of good words for today. All right, that's it for today. Today is Friday. Uh, so I'll see you on Monday. Go ahead and continue reading the Proverbs for Saturday and Sunday, the 25th and the 26th. On Monday, we'll come back with the 27th. All right, do me a favor. Also hit the share button. Invite people to get into wisdom. Take care.